we're going to kind of pick up where we left off last week. And I know I shared a lot of different things, and we're going to kind of recap real quick on some stuff. And again, this is in Ephesians 3, and we're going to start in verse 8, and I'll reread what we looked at. And, uh, and I know I shared many different things, and we won't take it just a little bit further, okay? Just a little bit further of what we did last weekend, because I just I, I began looking and, and kind of redoing some stuff, and I, and I found other things that, that I really wanted to find in the beginning. But anyway, let's just start in, in again in verse 8. In chapter 3, it says, To me, who am least than the least of all the saints. So, you know, Paul is saying, he's just showing a bunch of humility and being humble. You know, and that's the way we're all supposed to be. You know, we're not above anybody. We're, we're not. We're not above God. We're not above Jesus. We're not above each other. We're just, we're in the same ball game together. So, to me, who am least than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, you know, so we talked about that, you know, what the unsearchable things were, and to the Gentiles, which, you know, it, in the Old Testament, it talks about the Jews, they were the chosen ones, and the Gentiles were totally neglected, they were outcast and all this, but, you know, and, and we talked about how, what, what is the unsearchable things, you know, what, well, to many people, Jesus is totally unsearchable, they don't understand what it is, well, who he is, what he did, you know, even though they hear these things, they, they don't know what it, what he done. But we'll get into that in a minute. In verse 9 it says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. So that's, you know, all of this happened, was planned in the beginning, and now it has come to pass, as who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Now, where I want to pick back up at is on verse 10, okay? <clears throat> and it says, to the intent, which you all know what I, I told about that, which means intentions or a purpose, so there was a purpose, that now, notice he said that now. So Paul was saying that, you know, now. This is, this is when we need to share it and let it be known. It says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God. And, you know, we talked about the manifold, which means an abundant, abundant, many, a lot. Okay? A lot of it. And remember, I read in 1 Corinthians 2 and 6, or starting in 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. So, see, Paul is talking to the people at Corinth here. You know, he's talking, you know, we speak wisdom to the ones who are mature. And, you know, I touched on this last week. If you go and you begin sharing the gospel with someone and you begin sharing Jesus, and even if, even if you don't know Scripture, okay, just, just say you don't even know John 3.16. You can't even quote anything, but yet you begin telling someone who Jesus is, what he did in your life. You're conveying all these things. So really you're, you're sharing wisdom to someone who don't even know. But what Paul is talking about here is the ones who are mature. So in other words, he's taking it further. He's trying to explain further things, more in-depth things, the ones who are mature. So just like if you're trying to share your testimony with someone that's not even a Christian, then they're not mature. They, don't, they probably don't even have a clue what you're talking about, even though they possibly heard it. They still, in their heart, they don't know what you're talking about. So we speak among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, and that's kind of self-explanatory, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So there's, they're, they're just, there's nothing there. They're just, you know, if, if, if the rulers and everyone begin talking, there's really nothing there concerning God. So in verse 7 it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of, for our glory. So see, all of this was planned. Every bit of this was planned. See, the his, hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages. So what he's talking about, and yes it was, if you go back in the, in the Old Testament and the prophecies of you know Isaiah and all those who were talking about Jesus, you know, that was kind of a hidden wisdom. It was a hidden thing. Even though they were giving prophetic words, 
and this, all, all these different things about Jesus coming, these were hidden. And it was already foreordained all, all the way back then. It was planned. It was ready to come. So see, in reality, this was a mystery to the people. It was. At this, if, at this particular time in history, it wasn't just a hidden mystery. They, they didn't understand it, you know. So, like I said, we talked about this last week, but I just want to touch on it, kind of brings back us back to where we're at. And it goes on in verse 8, it says, which none of the rulers of this age knew. So, see, none of, none of these people at this particular time in history actually knew anything about what was going on. Yet they heard, but yet they didn't understand. It says, for, the, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In verse 9, it says, but as it is written... And this is, this is one of the key things. But as it is written, I has not seen your eyes, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And goes on, says, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So see, notice what it said in verse 9, That the eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which have prepared for those who love him. So see, even at this time, it, even this particular time in history, and even now, things were prepared all the way back in the beginning for those who love him, for those who truly love him, for the ones who truly love him and the ones who truly go after him and look for him. These things were prepared and ready. But see, even Paul said that, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. So see, even though they may not be given to anybody, things are revealed. And you may say, well, what do you mean? Well, I don't understand. Well, let's, let's look at it this way. You see, we're talking about a little bit about the mysteries of God. So taking it just a little bit further, a little bit further than, you know, not knowing Jesus and that type of stuff, just say you're, 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 you're a Christian, you're you know the Lord, you're dedicated to, to the church and that type of stuff. Have you ever had anything, anything come to your heart and you know without a shadow of a doubt, and no doubt in your mind, there's no question, there's no, 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 no anything that you know that God gave you something, that God revealed something to you just say you're reading the scripture. You're sitting there, you're reading something, and all of a sudden a light bulb goes off. You know what it means. You, you could just see it with your mind's eye. You, you, can, you just know it. You could feel God. The hair on your arm stood straight up. And all of these things, and you knew without a doubt God gave it to you. He revealed something to you. Now you go and try to explain it to somebody. You'll never do it. You'll never Show them what God revealed to you. Words don't express it. You can sit there and you, you just feel like you're just babbling because everything is in your inner spirit man. The depth of who you truly are in God. He revealed it to you, but yet words cannot express how you felt, what you seen with your heart, not with your mind, not with your imagination, but with your heart, what God showed you. He revealed it to you. And these things were prepared for the ones who love him, for the ones who seek him, for the ones who look at him, for the ones who look after him. With all the things, see, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So see, this, that, that's like a hidden wisdom. That's probably the best example I can give you. It's like, it, it is. It's something hidden with inside of you that, that possibly you could never express. And there's no doubt in my mind that each and every person in this room has had some form of experience like that with God. Just like the day you come to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You remember that day? Can, can you go back in your mind's eye and your heart and you remember that day that you truly accepted Christ as your Savior and your Lord and your King? Can you explain it to someone? No, you can't. You, you, can, you can pick words, you can choose words, but yet you cannot explain it because it's something that was for you, something that was revealed to you, something that God gave you. So in other words, all of that manifold wisdom of him and who he is, the abundance of it, and all of this. And then it says that it might be made known. 
And you know what that means? It means to become known, uh, to gain knowledge and that type of stuff. So in other words, it, we're supposed to be, it's supposed to be made known. Some of these things are supposed to be made known. We're supposed to share it the best we can, the best way that God gives it to us to share things. Even Galatians 1.11 says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. You see? I mean, anybody, anybody could come up here and do what I do. Anybody can. It don't matter who. You can pick somebody and they can come do what I do. Is it by man or is it by God? Did whoever come up and do this, did they pray over it? Did they study? Did they truly ask God to reveal things and show things? I'm not standing up here trying to toot my little horn. I'm not, but that's what the example I'm trying to give you. You've heard people on, on, on TV who, who can get up and they can give you this great, big, beautiful, elaborate sermon, and it don't do nothing in here. You leave, you leave there with no more than you had when you come in. So you kind of see what I'm getting at? It's not by man, but by God. <clears throat> so I just want to recap on that. Now this is, this is another thing where it says that it's supposed to be made known, and I touched on this a little bit. You know, how is it supposed to be made known to people? One is by seeking. You know, do, do people see you seeking God? Do they, do they see whenever they get around you? Do they say, okay, this, I know this person looks for God in everything. Just like now, we hear the rain. Where did it come from? It come from God. God gave it to us. Where else did it come from? You know, scientists will say it come from the ocean because it evaporated and all this type of stuff. Maybe that's how God did it, but he's the one who made it fall. You know, you got to put it in that aspect. Another thing is prayer. Pray without ceasing. Do people know that you pray? Do people know without a doubt if you called, if they called you today and said, pray for me, that you will pray and not just say, okay, I'll put you on the prayer list? Or do they pray for you then? Give you another example. Again, not tooting my horn, there was a young lady at work. She was really going through a hard time. She come to me and she was crying. I said, Daryl, I'm really having a hard time. Told me the story. And I said, well, look, I'll pray for you and I'll even put you on our prayer list. She said, pray now. And we prayed right then, right standing in the middle of the shop. We prayed. I'm not tooting my horn, friends, but that's what it means. If you tell somebody you're going to pray for them, pray for them. Do they know that if they come to you that they'll get prayed for? And you do you pray? Do you pray with your family, your friends, before a meal, all these things? Study. Do you study God's Word? If somebody asks a question, it is not so much that you may have the answer, but do you go and look it up for them? Do you help them? Do you study the Word? Be willing. And are you willing to do all these things? Jesus said in his word, he said, take up your cross daily. And a cross is not necessarily a burden. It's not necessarily a disease or a handicap and all those things. Do you give up things? Do you give up your time to study God's word? Do you give up your time to pray? Do you give up your time to seek, teach all of these different things? All of these things, are you willing? Not only that, but I even use the word practice. Do you practice what you preach? Do you truly do what you say you are? Are you who you say you are? Example, James 2 and 18 says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And it's not talking about going out here painting a building, friends. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about living the way you say you are. Are you that example? Are you who you say you are? If you have faith, then show it by your works. If you believe in God, show it by your works. All of these things, these, these small little examples, and, and the list goes on and on. It don't just, it's not confined to these few little items. It goes on and on. So see, all of these things are supposed to be made known. And what I'm getting at is this. If you see people and you, and you know that they don't know the Lord, or maybe they know how to spell God, they know how to spell Jesus, and they hear and understand, maybe to a little bit of degree, that he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, and that's what the Bible says. And that's all they know. That's all they want to know. But do they see, are you making it known to them how he works in your life? Because to them, it's a mystery. They don't understand it. They, they just, they cannot see it. 
Why? Because there's a two, and I'll say it, they don't know him. Period. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know how he works or anything. Now, this is going on. This is the part I want to get to. <clears throat> and I read this last week where it says it's to, in verse 10 in Ephesians, it says, To the intent, now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Again, we talked about this a little bit. The church. The word church actually means social group. That's what it means, a social group. You can have that anywhere. You can go to the ball field. You've got a social group. You can go to the golf course. All these different clubs, they're a social group. The actual word in the Bible is supposed to be ecclesia. Okay? That's where, that's where the word church actually comes from. Okay? But the word ecclesia means an assembly. It also means called out ones. The ones who are called out. We're supposed to be a group that is called out. Okay? Let me read some other stuff. In Christian theology, it means both a particular body of faithful people. Okay? That's in theology, the word ecclesia. Not church, ecclesia. And, the whole, and it also means the whole body of the faithful. The whole body. Okay? The whole body of the faithful. Okay? Now, this is another thing. I threw this in last week. <clears throat> and uh, let me make sure I got this right now. Yeah, Athens. In Athens, the word ecclesia means governing body. Okay? So that changes the whole ball game there, don't it? The whole ball game. Think about it. I'm not going to get into it, but think about it. A church being a governing body. Now, we're not talking about politics. We're not going to talking about going out and conquering the world. We're not talking about all those type of things. A governing body. A faithful body particular body a faithful group Remember, all this stuff is supposed to be made known by the church according to this verse remember it's supposed to be made known by the church all of these things the intent that now the manifold wisdom of god might be made known by the church by the ecclesia by the faithful people so see all of these things that we just kind of mentioned is supposed to be made known by us we're supposed to be making this known. The world is supposed to be seeing all of this thing. Now, this is the kicker. <clears throat> this is where it changes. To the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, I touched on this a little bit last week. Now, we're going to take it just a little bit further. Okay? Because I, I want us to kind of get a little bit more of an understanding of what this means. Now, the word principalities... Okay, I don't think I gave a definition of this last week. But the word principality, it actually comes from two words, principalities. Okay, first you've got a prince. That's what it means. A principality is a state ruled by a prince. That's what principalities mean. A state ruled by a prince. That's what it means. It also means a superhuman agencies angelic or demonic that's what it means and you know my phrase what's supposed to come out of my mouth go look it up that's what it means that's what it means you can find these phrases in a few places in the bible and i'm not going to read them it's romans 8 and 38 ephesians 3 10 which we read also one we're about to read 6 and 12 in ephesians colossians 1 and 16 chapter 2 and 10 and Chapter 2, verse 10 and verse 15. You can find those that phrase, principalities and powers in heavenly places. So now that you understand what a principality is, it's a place that is ruled by a prince. Okay? <clears throat> now the word powers. Now, the word uh, power, you know what power is. <clears throat> but you have, we have to understand, too, that even if it's a de demonic or angelic, okay? I'm trying to teach you something here. If it's demonic or angelic, either one. Now, when I say angelic, I mean the heavenly angelic, the heavenly host, the ones that Isaiah said that says, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Those angels. <clears throat> either way, they are limited to power. Okay? They are, they're limited. They, they can't up and do the things that God can do. They're limited. If you don't believe me, go back and read the book of Job. Remember? God told him. 
Okay, you can go do this, this, and this. That's all you can do. And that's all he did because that's as far as he could go. Came back, what did he do? God gave him a little bit more. You see? So they're limited. They cannot do anything unless God allows them. So they're limited. That's powers, okay? <clears throat> and then, then you got the phrase, in the heavenly places, okay? Now, if you go and you do some research on these particular phrases, okay, if you go and do some research on this, you'll find that some people, you, it's, not, it's not a conflicting thing, and it's not a debated thing, but you got two different things. you got some who believe that in this particular verse that we're supposed to be making these things known to the angelic beings which are up in heaven. Okay? That's what some believe. Okay? That's what some say. Some say that we're supposed to be making the things that God shows us and all these things known to the actual demonic principalities that we fight every day. That they're supposed to see what God gives us. Just prime example. If we say that we know that we have power over Satan, then we're going to prove it to him. Okay? That's what we're supposed to be making known, that demonic beings know that we stand for God, and God can work through us if we allow him. That's one example. <clears throat> And then another one says that we're supposed to be making these things known to the angelic beings which are in heaven to prove to them that God does and is and will do the things that he says he's going to do, such as send Jesus down here to die on the cross, raise him from the dead, that we may have salvation along with the fact that God works through us and can use us as long as we do are doing what his word says. So see, you, it's, it's not a great conflict thing. It's just different opinions and different ways that they look and interpret things in the Scriptures. So those are some examples. Now, also this word heavenly places, the term heaven, it says also refers to a spiritual heavens, which is up in heaven or spirit realm. Okay? Spirit realm. And also says a level of existence higher than the outside of the physical universe. You ever wonder, you ever wonder if God would allow each and every one of us to peel the film off of our eyes, what would we see? What would we truly see? Would we see into another dimension? And I know y'all thinking I'm crazy. But stop and think about it. Do we not sing songs that says, Open our spiritual eyes that we may see your glory? How are you going to see his glory? You ever wonder, you hear people, you, you hear the phrase about demonic beings and angelic beings all through the scriptures. Daniel seen them. Daniel seen them. The visions and all the different things. The realm means another place somewhere else besides the physical place that our eyes see i look out i see pews i can count pews i see physical things a little light here a cup these physical things but you ever wanted god to open up your eyes and peel the film off so that you could see beyond the physical being you remember that sermon i did where the man said that he's seen trees walking God opened his eyes for a little while, but yet he closed them. He gave him a chance to see. So see, friends, we can't rule these things out. We're talking about a God. We're talking about the King of Kings, the one who raised his son from the dead, the very one that can keep you out of hell. So we can't limit him. And that's one of the sad parts about the world today. And many of the churches, they put a limit on God. They put a limit on him. And once you, once you begin convincing people that God can't do certain things, then what happens? You become limited too. But this scripture says that we're supposed to be teaching something to somebody else that is not material, that is not physical. It says that we're supposed to be making these things known to principalities and powers in heavenly places or spirit realm. 
That's what heavenly places means. It means spirit realm. Heavenly places. I just read this. And not only that, but you can even go and you can read Daniel 10. Daniel and chapter 10. And you can find where even Daniel's prayers, Daniel's prayers that were being taken up, and you can find this in there. Go and read it. Where it talks about where Michael is having to fight demonic beings in the heavenly realms to get Daniel's prayers to God. It's in there. It's in there. Heavenly realms and heavenly places. Even in the book of Daniel chapter 10, it talks about the heavenlies. The, the word realm, this is what the word realm actually means. It means kingdom. That's what the word realm means. R-E-A-L-M. It means kingdom. Places in the Bible is actually realms means kingdom a field or demand <coughs> a field or domain of activity so that means there's activity going on how many times you ever hear, hear people and, and you, you may be thinking i'm crazy that's okay but how many times you ever hear people say that oh an angel was with me today i didn't have a wreck they must be believing something or are they just using a phrase? Do we say things just because we want to? If you say that I felt the Holy Spirit today, where, where, did, where does he live? You say, well, he lives inside of me. Well, then that means there's another place. Don't take anything away from God, friends. Don't take anything away from him. Don't take anything away from him. And what his word says because it's, it's, it's got to be somewhere. Just a prime example. I'm going to run through these real quick. Well, I did last week. Matthew 12 and 26. This is the ESV. And if Satan cast out Satan. In other words, Jesus was talking to someone. He's saying, well, you're a demon. You're, you're casting out. You're a demon and you're casting out demons. Well, Jesus said this. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Jesus said it, that Satan has a kingdom. He said he has one. Another one, 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, ESV. In, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Saying that Satan and his little minions and his little demons have blinded the minds of unbelievers. And they have. Look around you today. We wonder why people cannot believe and we wonder why people will not come into the church or won't follow the Lord or read the Bible or anything else. Why? I just read it. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. That's why. It says to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. For the glory of Christ who is the image of God. 1 John 5, 19, again, the ESV. We know that we are from God. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. It's in there. Go read it. You can have a copy of it with every verse. Another one. If 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, New King James Version, it says this, And no wonder, for Satan himself, listen, transforms himself into a angel of light to deceive people to make people think that this is okay it's good it's fine it don't hurt go do it do all these things and all these different things he transforms himself into an angel of light to make people think that they're following god Think about it. Do we not see this all over the world today? Do we not see this even around the places that we live? Another one. Ephesians 6 and 12. We talked about this earlier. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers, plural, of the darkness, darkness of this age. He's not talking about people. He's not talking about people. It says, against spiritual host of wickedness in, look again, the heavenly places. Same phrase. Same phrase. 
same one. See, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Another one, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, it says, And you have made alive, you and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, talking about us as Christians, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Every one of us, if we call ourselves a Christian, at one time we walked with the world. Okay, we did. We can't deny it. And it goes on and says, according, see, according to the prince of power of the air. Talking about Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons, see, the same spirit, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So, see, not only did we reject him when we come to know Jesus, but he still works in others. The sons of disobedience. The ones who don't want to follow him. The ones who don't want to do what he says do. The ones who don't want to do what God's word says. And another one, real quick. In Romans 8 and 38, <clears throat> it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, now you've heard this, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate, separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ the Jesus our Lord. So see, none of these things can separate us from His love. Not from Him. From His love. Okay? Shall other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus. So see, nothing, none of these things can separate us from his love. Now granted, we can walk away. We can. I shared this a few weeks back. We can. We can, you know, just like. Now, let me just give you this example. Y'all know on the cartoons, all of y'all are just as about as old as I am, and, and know, you know, the cartoons that you've seen on, on little when we was little kids, you know, I think Bugs Bunny and all of them. Remember? You'd be standing there watching all of a sudden this little devil on one side and an angel on the other side. Remember? Remember them little dudes popping up? I always think of that when I think of this. <laughs> you know, because you got, whenever somebody or something comes along and wants you to do something you know is wrong, according to God's Word. And he said, you know, you, you, you hear something said, oh, man, go on, do it. It ain't going to hurt a thing. You, you know, you, ain't nobody going to see it. Nobody's going to find out. Everything will be fine. Just go on and do it. And the other side says, no, don't do it. Leave it alone. Let it go. Just, uh, just walk away. Do all that. You know, just, you know what I'm talking about. But which one do you choose? If you choose the one who says, go do it, nobody's going to find out it's not going to hurt, you separated yourself from God. He never left. He never left. But you did. That's what it's talking about. None of these things can separate us from his love. None of them. It's us who separates us from his love. He'll never stop loving us. He never will. But we're the one who moves, not him. So what, what does that mean? You might say, what does that mean? Then that means you begin uh, going back to Ephesians 2, said, now works in the sons of disobedience. So you have kind of stepped over into what is taking you away from God. That's part of the powers and the principalities. So I hope in that little bit, I hope you understand a little bit more about what that means. You know, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't, guys. We fight against the evil part of the spirit realm. That's what we fight against. Moving on, real quick. All right, in verse 11 it says, According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So see, all of this was planned out. That we're supposed to be making it known to the world. We're supposed to be making it known even to the principalities and powers there. And, and this raises another, another, another question. Somebody may say, well, how do, how do, we, how do we make it known to them? If, if we're fighting against demons, how do we make it known against them? Or known to them what God wants to show? You take a stand. You stand and you fight. You say, in the name of Jesus, I will not do this. In the name of Jesus, you will not take my children. You will not touch my children. You will not harm my children because I claim them in the name of Jesus. I lay the blood of Jesus on them. I testify for them, and I will stand my ground and pray for them every day, every waking hour, that you will not harm my children. 
Not only that, but what about your land? You remember a while back when I told you about going and praying on the corners of your land? Have you ever done it? You stand your ground that they will not enter your home. They will not touch your home. And anything that comes on this ground will stale. And they will know that they're walking on holy ground because I stand for it. That's how you fight them. That's how you make it known to them. That's how you make it known to them. And how you make it known to the world is that whenever someone comes into your home, a prime example, what do they see showing on your TV? What do they see? When they walk into your home, what do they see? Do they see trinkets and gadgets and all these different things that has no, has no representation of God whatsoever? Making it known to the world. That's how you make it known. You stand your ground for what the Word of God says. And you believe it with every bit of your being. Everything. You don't allow things to come into your home that do not belong in your home. You don't. And that's what it takes. That's how you make it known. That's how you make it known to demons. That's how you, how you make it known to Satan. And that's how you make it known by the church to the world. To the unknown. Not the unknown world. The unknowing world. How many times has somebody ever walked inside your home and, and, you, and you tell them, no, I don't, I, we don't allow that in our house. Well, it's not going to hurt. You ever heard that phrase? I, there's, there's countless times I've heard it. It does hurt. You're bringing it into your home. Would you let somebody come into your house and sit down and do voodoo? Would you? No, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Well, then why in the world would you play something on TV that don't line up with God? What's the difference? Another quick example. When I was in the DR, and y'all probably heard me tell this story about the, the, a, a voodoo priest. Bless his heart, he died. I, I, it hurts. The man died. His name was Freddie. Never forget it. We was down there one time, and, and, and we, was, we was in his backyard, and all he had chicken bones, uh, a little cross that he burned, little stones around where he made sacrifices, and he, he was, he was a voodoo priest. And we were standing there, and just to show you, just to give you little, a little bit of an example of, of how people and, and, and satanic things kind of work. We were down there, and, and we were getting ready to leave, and I, and I said, and I, and I told Wilfredo, I said, I said, man, I said, why don't we pray for him before we go? Let's lay hands on him and pray for him. Well, he translated, and that man jumped back. He did. He stepped back, and he said, you ain't putting your hands on me. Because, friends, he knew the power of God. Demonic people that work under demonic influence know the power of God. He said, you can pray, but you're not going to touch me. Not that, not that any of us knew or thought anything would come through us, but he knew. He knew. And he didn't want it in him, around him, or anything. And that's the way we should be with Christ. That's the way we should be with Christ. And all of this, like I said, it was, it was planned. It was accomplished through Jesus Christ. All of this is accomplished through him. That was his plan. Real quick, verse 12, it says, in whom we have boldness and access and confidence through faith in him. Do we have this boldness? Do we have this confidence? And, and, and do we have the access? Do we have the access? Boldness means freedom in speaking. And, and uh, another one says, openly, frankly, and without concealment. That's what boldness is. Do we have that boldness to stand up? Do we truly have that boldness? In, in Ezekiel 22 and 30, and he says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall. He was looking for a man who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I not, should, should not destroy it, but I found none. Didn't even find anybody who would stand in that gap for him. It would stand in the gap for me, and that was a capital M. That was God. Who would stand in the gap for us? Who would stand in the gap? Are you willing to stand? Remember that word willing I put up there in, earlier? Another thing, just a prime example of Jesus standing, be a bold. And, and you know, the boldness of Christ when he was here, 
You know, it wasn't really that bad. I mean, sure, he stood up, but he stood up for God. This is another example. And in Matthew 23 and 33, starting there, it says, Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you expect the condemnation? How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues, in a church, and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barachai, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. You see what he called them? Serpents and brood of vipers. And I'm not telling you to go out there and call people that. I'm not. But he stood. Jesus stood with the boldness. Do we have boldness to even tell our own children or anybody? No, you're not bringing this into my house. That's boldness. It's not being rude. It's not being ugly. But it's standing for what you believe in. Standing for the Christ who done this for us. Making it known to the world. That manifold wisdom. That thing that people that don't understand. Now I'll throw this out there. Just like taking our children to see Harry Potter. All of this demonic and witch activity things that are on TV. That we allow our children to watch or even to read books. But there's nothing wrong with it, right? It don't hurt nobody. It don't hurt a thing. Next thing you know, your child don't go to church. Your child don't even look at the Bible because they, all they think about, they want to do magic. You know what magic is? Magic is a deception, a way to deceive your mind into thinking something that does not exist. That's what magic is. Do you want them to learn that or do you want them to learn the truth of who God is and who he stands for or what he is? Another example, Matthew 21 and 12. Then Jesus went into the temple. Y'all know this and and temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he said to them it is written my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it into a den of thieves think about your churches today I will share this and I probably shared this before and I have took a stand and I will continue to take a stand. I was asked one time right after we put these TVs up, are we going to show the Super Bowl? I said, you show it on that TV and I will not step foot back in this church again. You're not going to play that as long as I'm the preacher here. You look at the commercials on there. Half nude women, beer commercials, and all these things that they want you to go out and buy. And you want me to stand up here and preach what I'm preaching while you're watching this in here? Uh uh. It ain't happening. Because I'm standing up for God. I'm standing for what I believe in. I will go out there and preach in the rain if I have to. But as long as I'm the pastor of this church, I will do everything within the power that God gives me for it not to be defiled by anything. And I'm not tooting my horn, friend. That's what I believe in. I believe it. I believe in every word this book says. Everything. And it's the boldness taking a stand. Just like Jesus. It don't hurt a thing. I had rather get up there and him say, I, I like what you did, instead of, why didn't you do? Which one would you rather hear? The boldness. Taking a stand for what it truly means. Real quick, John 8 and 7, it says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And y'all know the story about the woman that was caught in adultery. You want a little bit of history? The man should have been there too, but according to the Old Testament, both of them were supposed to be stoned. Kind of makes you wonder about the priest, don't it? But see, he stood. He said, you're just as bad as they are chunk the stone if you're without sin 
taking a stand. Another one, real quick, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 3 says, And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God on tablets of stone, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human hearts. What's wrote on your heart? What's wrote on our hearts? Such is the confidence that we have. See that word confidence? It was in that verse. Do we have the confidence to do these things? Do we have the confidence that God gave us? Do we have the confidence in God that He'll stand there with us? Access means to bring, to move into the relationship with God whereby we are acceptable to Him and have assurance that He is favorably disposed toward us. Access. Ephesians 2 and 18 says, for Therefore, for through Him we both have access in one Spirit of God. Spirit to the God. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's your access. There's the access. Every bit of it. The word confidence, real quick, belief in that one can rely on someone or something. Firm trust, the state of feeling certain about the truth of something. Hebrews 10 and 19, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since you have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. That confidence. Last one, Acts 4 and 13 says, Now then, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and this is when they were preaching, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And every bit of it was through Christ. Every bit of it. They had the boldness, they had the confidence, and they knew where their access was. And it was through Christ to be able to share all the things. It says to me, who am the least of these, of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages was hidden in God who created all things through Christ, Jesus Christ. All of it, every bit of it, every, even the things that I have mentioned, says to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places or the spirit realm according to the eternal purpose eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus so to whom we have boldness and access with confidence with confidence through him or through faith in him and I hope you understand what I was getting at Paul, to me, was giving some of the most encouraging things in that letter, in that, those few verses, of the things that we have in Christ, of the things that God can give us, the things that God wants to show us. But guys, friends, family, we have to do.